All right. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Baton, CEO here at Practice Panther. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and let you know to please send us any questions you have in the chat, and we will cover all of them in the end. We're also going to be recording this webinar, so everyone will receive an email afterwards to review it. And if you're having any trouble hearing or seeing the webinar, you can always join us on our Facebook page as we are broadcasting it live at facebook.com slash practice panther. All right, so we are very excited to have Andrew Cabasa with us today on the line. I've been following Andrew's website, Juris page for years now, and uh, it's funny. The way I actually found about him was because every single time I search Google for any legal specific keyword, his website always came up on the top of Google. So this guy definitely knows what he's doing, and he's helped thousands of attorneys do the same. So Andrew, first of all, good job to you, and I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. And uh, I'm just going to give everyone a little bio about Andrew. Andrew is a practicing lawyer and the co-founder of JurisPage, which is now part of Uptime Legal. JurisPage is a leading legal marketing agency helping law firms build a web presence tailored to their audience with web design, search optimization, and online advertising. And he's also given many lectures and CLEs on website design and internet marketing. So, uh, Andrew, tell us a bit about what we're going to be covering today on the agenda. Yeah, thanks. So today, uh, basically the idea is uh, this webinar topic came about after we were talking with uh, some clients and then internally as a team, we realized that a lot of lawyers who had come to us, uh, we'd have conversations and they'd say, you know, I, I tried advertising, but I just know it's not going to work for our firm or I, you know what, I just... I, I'm getting more traffic with SEO, but it's just not turning into clients, so it must be that this can't work for my firm. And then after we dug into a little bit, we found that it's not necessarily that the medium or the channel is bad, it's that maybe there is something to the strategy that could be improved. So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, different aspects of online marketing. We're going to talk about uh, advertising, uh, particularly uh, pay-per-click advertising. We're going to talk about search optimization. We're going to talk about blogging uh, and social media, email marketing, and then also I think uh, one thing that a lot of marketers and law firms tend to overlook is the marketing management aspect of it. After you have done everything you can to optimize your web presence to generate more potential business and get more potential clients, what is your firm doing to turn those people into actual signed clients with signed retainer agreements. And this is one aspect that I really want to spend a good amount of time on because there is a lot that most every firm can improve on to, uh, and it's simple things that you could potentially do to make it much more likely that the people who end up reaching out to you become paying clients. Correct, I strongly agree. All right, so let's get started with uh, the first one, online advertising. Sure. So online advertising, there are a bunch of different channels uh, that you can use. Uh, the most popular that uh, we see is AdWords. It's uh, Google AdWords. So uh, when you search for, you know, uh, when you see someone who searches for family law attorney in Atlanta or New York injury lawyer or something like that, and then the first thing that, you, that the visitor sees in Google is always going to be uh, between typically between two to four ads, followed by a Google Maps, followed by other organic results. But the first things that show up are the ads. And Google lets you advertise specifically to uh, very specific search terms. So you can advertise to uh, divorce lawyer in your city, or you can advertise towards uh, you know injury lawyer, or you can also be specific enough but keep out certain words. They're called uh, negative keywords. So yeah. one common thing is uh, having a negative keyword for uh, terms like jobs or careers because you don't want to pay 20 to potentially $200 for a click if someone's searching for personal injury lawyer jobs uh, because that's clearly someone who is not uh, looking for a lawyer in your practice area. Uh, when a lot of firms sign up with Google AdWords, usually the first thing that happens is a Google rep calls you to try and help you set up your campaign. And you know, the biggest thing I could say is take their advice with a grain of salt because yes. 
<laughs> Does that happen to you? Oh my God! They're like, yeah, let's just do all these keywords, broad match. Let's just spend thousands and with no return. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and 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 that's that's you know their their incentive is let's get you spending as much as possible. Um, and so what they'll do is that like like you said they'll do something which is called a a broad match keyword, which if I it mean basically is. Uh, if I have personal injury lawyer uh, as my broad keyword, uh, Google will uh, show the ad to anything even broadly related to the idea of personal injury lawyer. So it could maybe personal injury law, law, injury, personal injury lawyer, personal injury attorney. Uh, it could be medical malpractice. It could it could be car accident lawyer. It could be you know injury lawyer careers or things like that or injury personal injury statistics potentially uh, the broad the broadest match keyword uh, provides a lot of potential uh, at like keyword you show up for a lot of uh, terms that you may not necessarily want so typically what we recommend are uh, what are called uh, broad match modified so it's basically instead of the term being personal injury lawyer it's as you put it into Google AdWords, plus personal, plus injury, plus lawyer, which w effectively makes it so that you, every one of those three words, personal, injury, and lawyer, have to show up uh, in some sequence in the actual keyword that someone searches. Uh, a, more, a more precise keyword would be what they call phrase match, which is basically the keyword in quotes uh, as you're typing it into Google. And that gets you the exact, uh, that phrasing, so personal injury lawyer, in quotes, gets you only keyword searches of personal injury lawyer and potentially something around that. So, like local personal injury lawyer would show up, or personal injury lawyer, you know, New York City might show up if if you're targeting that geographic area. Um, and then there is, you know, more specific beyond that, which it's called exact match, which is uh, basically the keyword in brackets where you only get that very specific search term. So if it's personal injury lawyer, you only show up when, when someone searches for the exact term personal injury lawyer and nothing broader than that. Now that's like the best you can do, uh, but uh, in terms of getting, getting exactly what you're looking for, but the drawback is that there's a lot less search volume uh, for that. So you, you need to use those with, uh, you know, you'll need to use those exact match along with some phrase match and probably some broad match modified. Right. Um, and I'm, but, I'm just going to jump in here for a second. Yeah. I know that we have a lot of people that, that always listen in that <clears throat> aren't as, uh, as techy as us. Mm -hmm. So for those listening, like, what is he talking about? So <laughs> this is very advanced. So what we're trying to tell you is if you're going to be doing Google Ads, do not do Google. What do they call it, Andy? It's, uh, it's like their quick start guide. What oh, do they call it? Their AdWords Express. Express. Is the it's yes. terrible. Do not do that. They will... Screw you so bad, you'll spend so much money. After spending $1,000, you'll be like, well, this didn't work. I'm just going to stop it and never use it again. So yeah. just do yourself a favor. Don't use Google AdWords yourself. Don't call Google for help. It's not going to work. What I really recommend, the way I personally learned it and mastered it, I bought yeah. this book. It's a great book for, for beginners. It's called Google AdWords, Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords. It's about 400 pages long, but it's a really awesome read. Even if you're not going to cool. do everything yourself, at least now you know what the marketers are doing, so you can always hire someone to do it for you, but now you know what they're doing, and you can give them advice, and it will really help you out. So that's my recommendation, at least. Yeah, and we, we also do have a ton of content. I, we have a, a, a PVC ebook or email course somewhere out there uh, that kind of gives you a crash course in AdWords. Um, cool. What I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time today about advertising in particular is uh, one area that I, that I see a lot is um, there are, in, in my experience, there are some practice areas that do better than others for advertising. Um, and so what I mean is, so the more consumer-oriented practice areas, and by consumer-oriented I mean where you're working, where your clients are individuals rather than organizations, tend to do better, tend to be have much more search volume in uh, Google than, uh, you know, businesses. So uh, for example, commercial litigation, while there may be some traffic in it in Google, it doesn't tend to get as much search traffic or as many clients as, say, uh, family law. Uh, in particular, the areas that, that you know, we've had experience with that do, that kind of, that really kill it with uh, Google advertising 
some examples are family law, personal injury, DUI and criminal defense, estate planning and probate, uh, employment law, employee side employment law, uh, you know, suing, for, suing an employer for uh, discrimination or wage and hour, uh, immigration law, uh, residential real estate, and one interesting area that uh, was a bit of a surprise that uh, tends to do very well also is patent law. So uh, I, may, I, I have my broad sweeping generalization about uh, business law and not getting as much search volume, but patent law uh, can do well as, as well. Um, so if you are in one of these practice areas that are consumer facing and you've tried advertising and haven't had success, uh, my gut instinct is there's probably something uh, wrong with the campaign or something that's not optimized because from what we've seen is those practice areas can do very well. Um, one thing is that, that uh, needs to be taken into consideration is you know there you need a certain budget for advertising um, and you know have to have expectations in line. So family law is you know probably my my favorite to advertise in because the cost per lead, the cost per new cl new potential client is a lot lower than other practice areas. So you could spend potentially five hundred to a thousand dollars a month and see a good number of potential clients uh, calling you. Uh, for uh, an area like uh, personal injury, uh, on the other hand, you really need. I, I, my recommendation is really $5,000 a month. And I know that's a lot for a lot of firms, but personal injury, you know, the, the risk versus the reward, the value of the potential client is so high that there are a lot of firms, that it's very competitive and there are a lot of firms that are spending a ton of money which drives, which, and are driving up the uh, cost per click. Right. Um, so that, that's kind of my take on Google AdWords. Uh, one other secret, secret that I want to talk about um, don't tell everyone, because uh, you, you got to use this for yourself. <laughs> Big ads. Is, is uh, well, yeah, well, actually I got a few then. Uh, Bing ads, uh, Bing, yes, uh, that's right. Bing is a lot less expensive uh, than Google, in my experience. Uh, there tends to be less search volume uh, in Bing, because I, it's, I think, of the search engine, search engine traffic, I think Bing has like a third of Google's. Um, so you may, you'll, you'll absolutely see fewer clicks, but the uh, typical cost per click is a lot less expensive uh, than in Google. And from what I've seen in some practice areas, you can have, you can be spending half the amount uh, per click. And Bing's dashboard is great because they pretty much know that you probably built your campaign in Google, and that's fine. That's fine. You built your campaign in Google. That's great. Uh, but you can import your campaign from Google into Bing. And so if you have your campaign in Google optimized uh, and ready to go, you can just import the entire thing wholesale into Bing. You can set your budget and then be ready to go. And then you, then you have this additional source of uh, low, cost, low uh, cost per click uh, potential leads. Yep. Um, uh, one other area I wanted to talk about is... Uh, the about uh, uh, language, uh, English language uh, AdWords uh, is very competitive for a lot of legal practice areas. Uh, legal industry, I think, of the I think it's like of the six or seven most uh, expensive keywords. Four of them are uh, related to law practice or uh, practice areas, um, and so. Uh, getting getting potential clients can be costly for some practice areas, but while English is English language ads and keywords are tend to be uh, more expensive, uh, Spanish language and other language uh, keywords are nowhere near as expensive. So, if you want to advertise for auto accidents uh, in English, for example, you can end up spending uh, for uh, I've seen like four hundred plus dollars per click for a very, very specific, very targeted uh, keyword. But for a Spanish language, you know, uh, 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 auto, auto accident keyword, you can end up spending a lot less for the, for the same kind of 
uh, potential lead. Uh, wow. the, the thing that you need, though, is you have to make sure that if you are advertising in Spanish or Tagalog or French or German... You have someone that oh, speaks that language when they call in, yeah. Yes, um, and uh, what I've seen firms do is uh, that basically uh, some, sometimes they have a, uh, a Spanish-speaking uh, associate or a paralegal on staff, and they will route those uh, those uh, landing page forms and, or those uh, phone calls specifically to those uh, staff members who can speak uh, with the clients. Um, and that's that can end up saving you a lot and making you much more competitive and, still, and get those clicks that you're looking for uh, uh, if you don't have the budget for uh, an English language campaign. Um, the other two areas that I do want, do want to touch on are uh, Facebook ads and uh, retargeting ads. So uh, AdRoll is a retargeting service, basically meaning that if someone, uh, if you sign up for AdRoll or another, any of uh, plenty of retargeting options, AdRoll is just the, probably the most well-known example. If, if you sign up for that site, someone visits your website and then go visits another website, they could see an ad for your firm. Uh, retargeting ads generally cost a lot less than Google or Bing ads, and it can be beneficial because if someone you know visited your site and then just didn't reach out to you, this is a reminder to them to hey, maybe come back, get in touch, and finish that finish filling out that contact form. And it's someone, it's kind of like a warm lead because they already know you to some degree, uh, and this does, you know, it retargets, it kind of, it captures them and brings them back. Um, and it, it can end up being uh, a lot less expensive than having to reach out cold to someone who is searching for a lawyer. Uh, Facebook ads, Facebook also offers retargeting. Uh, uh, but Facebook also has its own uh, advertising platform where you can basically target, and it's when you think about it, it's really creepy uh, <laughs> because uh, you can target people very specifically. Uh, you can target uh, men between the ages of 25 and 27 located in uh, a particular zip code or a particular city. Uh, you can target people who have a certain interest. You could target people whose interests are law practice if you're looking to represent uh, other lawyers, for example. Um, if, you, if you do a lot of uh, personal injury work for, um, I don't know, or if you do a lot of, one, one thing you could do is if, you're, if you're dealing with uh, employment litigation, if you want to target people who work for a certain big box retailer, uh, you may be able to do that as well. Right, uh, so it's also like a little warning. So for people listening, watch out the information you put on Facebook. That's why the ads are so targeted towards you. So they can target what school you went to, and, and pretty much, Andy, how does it work exactly? So if I, you know, let's say I got a dog recently, and I'm clicking yeah. a lot of videos for dogs, like, like, like. So now they know that I like dog videos. So they're probably going to start targeting dog ads to me. Is that how it works? Based on what I click on and like? Yeah, basically. Uh, they, like, there are some things that. Uh, there's some things that Facebook will do to you know kind of build out your profile. Is uh, Facebook knows everything that you've liked. They know every page that you've liked, um, and you know brands in particular. Like so, if you like a certain brand of, uh, if I don't know, I'm sure there are plenty, probably plenty of people who like the wellness brand of pet food. And if you like that, chances are you're probably a pet owner. Um, but Facebook basically builds a very comprehensive profile of what it, what it thinks you are. And you can actually check out some of the data that, that Facebook kind of assign, ascribes to you uh, in, in the Facebook settings and in the privacy settings. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's creepy. Uh, but it works for advertisers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. I'm going to look at that. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so that's my quick run through of you know, tips for uh, online advertising. I, I know we have a bunch of areas to cover, and I just wanted to share some of my recommendations in that. But basically, uh, check out if you're advertising in Google and you're not finding success. Uh, my, I'd probably recommend reevaluating the campaign because uh, it, it, if you're focusing on a consumer area, uh, it should be generating business for you. If the costs are are too much, then I'd evaluate Bing and retargeting and uh, Facebook potentially as well. And uh, if you have someone in your office who speaks Spanish, 
uh, or other uh, languages other than English, I'd consider ads and landing pages uh, and advertising for those as well. Got it. So, Andy, you have a question. So, you and I both yeah. know a lot about these advertising platforms, and they are so advanced. So, the average person really can't set it up in a way that it's going to be super effective or successful. So, what I've seen a lot of times is a lot of people that I know, yeah, I tried Facebook ads, I tried Google ads, just too expensive, didn't work. That, that's always the same story. Or same with a blog. I have a blog, I did a few posts, nothing, you know, they just don't know what they're doing 100%. So, when is it time for someone to bring in an outside marketer, consultant, someone to help them out, and how much does it generally cost? If someone says, okay, I want to try out AdWords, I want to spend 1000 a month, how much will it cost them to have an expert come and set it up for them and manage it for them and do stuff like that, generally? Um, sure. So, for, for the most part, uh, and I, we've worked with a lot of different uh, law firms and their advertising campaigns over the years. Um, in Every single instance we, that we've seen where we've come in where they've had a campaign, uh, we've been able to make improvements on the campaign to the point where uh, it, point where the uh, the cost of our service uh, was more than paid for itself by their savings in their in in that they saw uh, in the campaign. So, right. for example, recent, recently we were working with uh, a firm in Florida uh, that does divorce law and family law, and they're spending about between I think it was between fifteen hundred to two thousand a month, and they were seeing that you know they got about they were getting like twenty uh, new leads a month, and they were like you know what I think we can do better, and we restructured the campaign, and they went from twenty leads a month to sixty leads the next month, um, and it was because that well they had a lot of good stuff going on, they you know they're we're working with a law firm, we're not working with uh, a marketing agency or someone who has who has the experience of you know knowing what what you can do to get the most out of the campaigns about how to break up the campaigns how to break up the ad groups uh, what keywords to target what keywords to get rid of because they're too expensive what negative keywords to add to avoid spending unnecessarily um, and how to set up tracking so you know exactly how much it's costing you to get a new lead uh, but in general like what what you typically see with uh, marketing agencies agencies is They'll typically cost starting between like three fifty to five hundred a month, uh, or they'll charge a percentage of ad spend. Uh, okay. Anywhere, yeah, and it's usually around twenty percent. Uh, like we we charge twenty percent of ad spend uh, or five hundred dollars typically uh, for the campaign management. Got it. So if someone listening is thinking of going with a marketing agency, the goal obviously for them is whatever costs they're spending with them should be, you know, should be covered by the new results and successes they're going to bring to them. Right. Basically. And you yeah, and you should you should know this because you should the 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 firm should get data and you should be accessing data on on everything. You should be able to know how much how many leads you got, how much it cost per lead, what your total spend was. Uh, I know that there are some agencies that will say you're going to spend uh, $2000 a month and some of it will go to ads and some of it will go to uh, SEO, just very broadly, they'll say, and they, you don't really get a breakdown. You only get a breakdown of, hey, you got this many leads uh, from SEO and PPC for this spend that you paid us, but you really don't know necessarily how much was spent exactly on advertising. Uh, you should get a breakdown, and you should uh, get access to Google AdWords if you can, or Bing Ads, the platform itself, so you can see how many clicks you got and how much it's costing you. So you, you can see what you're really getting out of it. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. So let's move on to the next section. Uh, very exciting. SEO. So a lot of people hear the word SEO. So kind of give us a rundown of what is SEO, what does it mean, and how can people, I guess, uh, do it themselves? Or yeah, sure. So search optimization uh, broadly, it's uh, working to get better visibility in Google and other search engines. Uh, organically, so in a non-paid ad sort of way, so that when someone searches for uh, your practice area or your firm name, uh, for example, the first thing that shows up is your firm, uh, and when they click on it, you don't have to pay Google to do it. Now, the, the key to search engine optimization is understanding Google's algorithm and how Google promotes or penalizes sites and search results so that you can uh, get the most out of 
uh, so you can get the most out of it and that you can ideally get to the top of Google search results. Now, Google's algorithm is constantly evolving. It used to be years ago that if you, that people uh, understood that if you shoved a ton of keywords in your website, so you said uh, personal injury lawyer, personal injury attorneys, personal injury law firm serving these, these cities, and you list like 50 cities, you would show up in Google, and Google basically put a stop to that with, its, with an algorithm update and killed traffic for a lot of businesses and law firms. The, and, it's, and it's constantly evolving because Google's incentive is to make sure that the most relevant websites show up uh, at the top of search results. Um, more recently, Google, and more recently in the last few years, Google has been heavily promoting uh, more local search-oriented results. And by that I mean if you search for uh, you know, uh, your practice area, if you search for a criminal defense lawyer in your city, you'll notice that the first thing that shows up in search results is, the, is an ad, and right below that is a Google Maps uh, widget, basically with uh, three to four uh, uh, locations on a Google map. Um, this is the case whether you're using a, doing a desktop search or a mobile search, but basically Google's been seeing that more and more traffic, and now more than 50% of traffic is coming from mobile devices, and it's clear that based on Google's, that Google's seeing based on uh, their users' intent is that people care a lot about uh, what about local, about what's around them locally. So now, like now, it's been very important that the focus of any law firm trying to get better search visibility is local based. And our biggest recommendations for that are is what we've seen is one of uh, the biggest factors for Google in determining what it gets better uh, visibility in Google Maps are directory listings. So getting your firm into directories like yellowpages.com, yelp.com, and the most important one is Google My Business. So if you go to google.com slash business, you can create your own profile uh, for your business, and then what Google does is it's kind of wacky. They, they mail out a postcard to your office address with a five-digit code that you have to enter in on, on the website to basically confirm and validate that you are at that address um, and that you have control, basically. Um, so if you, are get, if you are trying to create as many directory listings as possible across uh, different websites, like Google Business, like Yelp, uh, or Avo, or Lawyers.com, or, or Manta, or Superpages, any of these directories, uh, one thing I'd recommend, a very important thing, is making sure that your your business name, that your address, and your phone number are all consistent. Because Google sees uh, one two three Fake Street Suite one o two different from one two three Fake St period Ste period one o two. Like if you use abbreviations or you have a period or a comma somewhere that you don't in another another listing it's not going to be considered consistent just because the algorithm isn't smart enough at this point to recognize that it's the same. And so it, it can be considered a different listing and it won't give you that benefit that you need in search, uh, in search results. So the biggest recommendation, name, address, phone number, make sure they are all consistent across every single site that you build on. Awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. I, I highly agree. So let's uh, let's go on to the next one, which is one of my favorites, actually blogging. So the funny thing is, like I said before, a yeah. lot of attorneys, a lot of just people in general, they they all heard I need a blog. They get a WordPress site, they get a WordPress blog, they put up five blog posts, and they never ever do it again. They never get results, they never see anything, so they just give up. And the worst thing that could happen is that a potential customer comes to your site and sees your last blog post was in 2012. So they probably they might think you're out of business, you're not updating your site, you're not on top of it. So if you're going to be one of those people, I highly recommend you just remove the dates off your blog post. You'll have to get like a WordPress um, editor, developer to just remove the dates so no one sees that your blog is outdated or just post new good content. So uh, Andrew, I'll let you take it from here and then I'm going to kind of uh, share like some plugins in WordPress that will help some people out. Awesome. Uh, sounds good. So I, I'm, as, yeah, David, I'm sure as you've seen, there are, we've encountered a lot of blogs in the past when we've been working on sites where there, there's either, like, 
either the firm started off strong and was blogging back in 2012, 2013, or 2014, and then hasn't written anything in three years, or the firm started out by writing two blog posts right away and then hasn't written anything since. Uh, being consistent is important, not just for appearance's sake, but for your search visibility. Uh, blogging really ser it serves a couple of important functions. One is it, it helps with uh, organic search visibility, um, but two is that the content that, <coughs> that you're posting, that you're going to be sharing potentially with your audience, stuff that you might want to put in a newsletter, is going to help uh, your existing audience, your other lawyers in your network, referrals, existing clients, um, helps connect with them and helps you stay top of mind with them uh, so that if they want to refer people your way, um, uh, this content reminds them, oh yeah, this is a, uh, I have a friend who needs a, it reminds them, oh yeah, I have a friend who needs a lawyer in this practice area, I can refer them to this law firm, and this law firm is demonstrating their expertise. Um, so what I recommend with blogging, and a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers that, that try out blogging and then just don't see any success in search engines, often the biggest thing that I see that is the issue is you're not necessarily writing about the right things and you're not writing in a language that your audience understands. So if you're if you're if you're doing uh, you know personal injury law or family law, for example, the things that your potential clients, you know, individuals and families want to read about, or and what they're searching for is they're not looking for uh, the latest Supreme Court case or your hot take on that. They're not looking for uh, they're not looking to know what res ipsa locator or key tam lawsuits are necessarily because they, they don't know what that is uh, and, or that's not really relevant to them. They're searching for things like, I was hit by a city bus, uh, what, what do I do now, Who, how long do I have to file a lawsuit? And you know, in a lot of jurisdictions, you know, there, there are very specific things you have to do when, you were, uh, when you're involved in an accident with, gov with uh, uh, government, like 90 days or something like that to file or to give notice. Um, but people are searching for answers to questions like that. And so usually the first thing I, I, I say is uh, the questions that you get in intake interviews and the way that you explain those answers to those questions, that's perfect for the type of blogging that you should be doing that connects with your audience. The types of questions, the questions that you are getting in intake interviews, people are definitely typing into search engines. And, if you want an example, if you go to a, a Q&A website like uh, Quora, that's Q-U-O-R-A dot com, or Avo's forum of legal answers, you'll see that there are a ton of people asking questions about, about your practice area, in, and those kind of questions that you're seeing could be great topics for blogs. Um, so basically, don't go esoteric. Don't... Uh, unless your audience, unless you're really trying to have the blog to connect with other lawyers and demonstrate your expertise, um, I, I wouldn't really focus on Supreme Court cases or developments in the law necessarily, uh, unless, unless you know that's perfect for your audience. But if you're trying to reach individuals and uh, families, I'd focus more on FAQ content. Um, one uh, secret uh, that I'd recommend is dealing is doing some competition research. So if you want to show up, uh, if you're blogging because you want to get better search visibility for a uh, divorce lawyer in Cleveland, let's say, I would search for divorce lawyer in Cleveland and see what the top ranking uh, law firm websites are posting content about. And what you can do is you know see their blog posts and then write better blog posts on the same topic. Uh, if you can outdo them, um, then you can uh, see some uh, better benefits to search visibility. Now, there's, there can be a lot more that goes into it, uh, but that's you know, broadly my recommendation is look at what the most successful firms are doing uh, and do it better. Awesome. I definitely agree. Very good. And uh, we actually have a question on this. So Natalie yeah. uh, asked us, are vlogs just as effective as blogs? So for those listening, a vlog, V-log is a video blog, basically. So every week, 
They post up really good videos. Um, kind of related to what you said, Andy, about like frequently asked questions. They're, they're doing a really good job. I know them personally. They're, they're doing a great job. So I'll answer first, and let, I'll let you take it from there. So I think the way you guys are doing it is excellent. You're posting a video once a week on your blog, on your website, on Facebook with frequently asked questions that your clients want to know, which is excellent because you're giving them really good high quality content. And also you you keep making it top of mind for me. So for me, I keep seeing their video posts on Facebook of how to get out of a ticket, a, a parking ticket, a traffic ticket, red light ticket. So I'm always like, wow, that's good advice, number one. But number two, they're always on the top of my mind. So anytime a friend gets a ticket, I'm like, oh, I recommend them because they're on the top of my mind. So that's number two. As far as SEO benefits, I would recommend that you create a blog post that has at least 400 to 600 words that goes along with the video. So what you can do is just transcribe the video and put all the text underneath the video because Google will rank that blog post higher if you have at least four or five, six hundred words in the post. Um, Andy, you want to cover that? Um you know, you've covered it pretty well. The only real thing, <laughs> the, the only real thing that I'd add, and you know, Natalie, thanks for the question. The only real thing that I'd add is that an additional benefit that you're getting is provided that you know you first post the video to uh, YouTube. Uh, is that YouTube is the second most popular search engine behind Google, and Google owns YouTube, and uh, a lot of searches are coming through YouTube, and Google also embeds and promotes YouTube videos in its Google search results. So posting a video to YouTube and then embedding that video uh, along with some additional you know, content like 400 to 600 words in a blog post uh, is a really winning combination because you get to attack Google kind of from two fronts in that you have the video that's, that you know, if provided that you add a good description in the YouTube uh, video uh, in the text underneath that provided that you add you know, some tags to the video, it's going to show up uh, well in YouTube as well as Google, and then the blog post itself uh, you know, with, the, with the additional text can, can show up also, and I recommend that. But uh, I personally love, love video content. Um, it, one thing that I consistently hear from uh, lawyers that we work with that do videos is they wish that they started them sooner. You know, the problem is for a, a lot of lawyers, if they're doing kind of like high quality production videos where they're being interviewed and there's you know a lighting and a backdrop because they want to have like a fancy video on their site uh, is that you know it, it can be expensive but uh, I personally love the the webcam videos and I, I've done them myself where you do a webcam video with you answering a question or talking to the camera uh, related to your practice area is that the clients end up saying to the lawyer you know I wasn't sure I visited your website, I read some of your content, but I saw your video and I saw you explaining to me this area of law and I saw myself working with you. And that made me want to reach out. And that's really powerful. So for that, I would definitely recommend uh, looking into doing some video. Wow, awesome. I definitely agree. And uh, for those listening, you don't need a crazy fancy production. You can just get a tripod on Amazon for five bucks to hold up your iPhone, which takes HD quality video, and then have a nice backdrop, maybe some of your office. You can buy a $30 microphone if you want really good audio from Amazon, and that's it for $35. You have a, a really good setup that you can use, and it's really easy to just take a video and then just throw it online. So it's very, it doesn't have to be high quality, crazy production. It can be as simple as that. So um, one more thing I will add if you are doing videos. So one thing, Natalie, I could recommend for you and anyone else listening, if you're going to do a video that says how to get out of a red light camera ticket, you should add to the end of that how to get out of a red light camera ticket in Miami, Florida, in Miami-Dade, Florida, in South Florida. Add those words to the end so it's relevant because you don't want to get someone to send you a ticket from New York if you only work in Miami. It's, it's not really going to do much help for you. So that's my that's advice. Great. Now, for everyone tuning in, I know people have this in the background, Switch to our screen now because we're going to show you a few things on WordPress. If you have a WordPress website, definitely switch over to watch what we're about to show you. So I'm going to pull up Practice Panthers WordPress site right here so you can kind of see like the back end. And what you want to do on WordPress, on the left, you can go to your plugins and click Add New Plugin. 
On the top right, you want to search for a plugin called Yoast, Y-O-A-S-T. And it's right here. It's called Yoast SEO. You add the plugin in and you activate it. Not a problem. Now, what you're going to do, whenever you create a new blog post, this is how you should be doing it. So first <laughs> of all, yeah, I threw you in here while you were, while you were right. speaking. So, so basically, this is the type of blog post that you need to be making, which is exactly what Andy just said. The title of the post should be five questions you should ask a family attorney in Miami, Florida. So you have the location and you have the FAQ or how do I get a divorce in Miami, Florida? How do I hire a divorce attorney in Miami, Florida? You know, these are all the things that people are searching for. So that's step one. This has to be your title, something like this. Step two, the link. The link should also have all this information in the link. It shouldn't just say 19856, whatever. You know, it has to have this here also. Google loves this, okay? Number three, when you're actually writing the post, you want at least 500 words if possible, more than this, 500 words, and you generally want something called an H1, which is this giant text with your keyword in it again. So how do you do this? You highlight the text, and over here where it says heading one, usually it will say paragraph, so you highlight it and click heading one. That's what you want. Now, I threw Andy's image here as well. It's always good to have images, but for another reason, when you add an image in WordPress, it will give you all this information on the right. So you want to take that keyword, that title, and throw it into the title, to the alt text, to the description, as many places and you, as you can, and insert it into the post. Why do we do this? If someone searches Google for a family attorney in Miami, Florida, and they search Google Images, which people do, they will see an image of you as a family attorney in Miami, Florida. So it will also bring in traffic. Now, once again, keep in mind, I'm mentioning this keyword in the title, in the URL, in the H1, in the image, and once again over here. That's probably good enough. I wouldn't overdo it and throw it 100 times because you will actually get penalized. So the general rule of thumb is 1% to 3% of your text should have that keyword. So for 500 words, three to five times is, is usually okay. Now, the Yoast plugin, when you scroll down, you're gonna have this new box here when adding a new post, okay? So it's gonna show you how it's gonna look in Google. So this is the really cool. You can click here, which will show you the description of what people see in Google, and it's gonna show up right here, and you could actually change that description. So once again, you guessed it, you want to add in something compelling to make them click on it, but also have your title and keywords here again. Now, if I mention attorney, I might also want to put the word lawyer, family attorney, family lawyer, divorce lawyer, put all those combinations in so it will show up when they search for it. And that's how you really are supposed to blog. And one last thing, on the right you have your tags. You always want to add in family attorney, divorce cases, all the different keywords you could add in here as well. This will also help out. So that's the correct way to blog. And if you do this and you follow these instructions, this blog post will most likely get to the top of Google in a few months. And uh, the cool thing about Yoast, they do kind of like an SEO check on this article. So you can scroll down and do an analysis and it will show you if you put a keyword here, so let's say family attorney, it will show you are there enough links, is there enough text, is there enough keyword density? Is it too much? Like it just goes through a whole list of things. So ideally, you want to get everything in the green. And if you do, and you could save the post on top, it will show you if the SEO is good up here. If it's green, you're good to go. You could publish the post. Um, Andy, anything you want to add on this? No, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> uh, all of that I would rec definitely recommend. We also use uh, Yoast, and I, I personally like love like we didn't. The Yoast didn't always have that green light uh, set up going on with that kind of detail, and so when they added that, I, it was great because um, uh, it, it, it's been, it was a lot easier to kind of teach law firms how to, like, what they should be considering when they're writing blog posts, uh, specifically for better search visibility, uh, rather than kind of the rule of thumb stuff that I've, I've known for a long time that, and stuff that I've, I've figured out over the years. Yoast takes care of it for you. Exactly, awesome. And it does a lot more than that. Also, we're just covering the basics of Yoast. It does a lot more in the background. You can keep going advanced, but if you just install it, it will help you a lot. 
All right, so let's get to the next topic, which is reviews. Oh, very important, my, one of my favorite topics. All right, talk to us about reviews. Basically, quick summary, get reviews. Uh, just like, uh, ju just like uh, when you're going to a restaurant or trying to figure out what restaurant to go to, you're going to search for a restaurant in your area, and you're going to see uh, positive or negative reviews, or you're going to Amazon to buy something. Uh, you're going to look at the reviews. People do the same for lawyers, and it's increasingly common. Now, uh, plenty of lawyers have said, have said to me, you know, I don't, I don't think that's the case, or, uh, you know what, I am a very well-respected lawyer in my community. Uh, people won't be looking at, at reviews. But the thing is, they, we, we have this data, we know very confidently that they will. And in particular, because hiring a lawyer is not often, uh, and it is not often an inexpensive uh, endeavor, especially if you know you're, you're in an area that's not a contingency fee, uh, you have to make sure that you're hiring the right lawyer, the one that has relevant experience, one that's going to answer your phone calls and has good customer service uh, and knows what they're doing. And so, uh, just like you, just like people get referrals to lawyers if they don't have a referral or they want to check up on the lawyer, they're going to uh, they're going to want to go to the internet to basically check up on that law firm. Uh, whether, you got, whether you have a referral or not, people will look at reviews because they want to know confidently that you can handle their particular type of matter. Um, uh, now, I, I have a question on that, actually. Yeah. So where should attorneys be sending their clients to leave them reviews? On their Facebook page, on Google Business page, on Avvo? Uh, good question. Uh, so typically, uh, and this is something that, that we've done also, is you want to make sure that you're going to get a great review. So the first, before you send them to a, another website, what I typically do is I would create a like, Google form or a, use like a free form software like SurveyMonkey or something like that and ask, the, ask, for, you know, ask for a review. And then provided that the review is you know, highly positive, then I would say, you know, I, I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, I know it would help other clients in the future and potential clients when they're looking at our firm to know uh, about your experience to help them kind of evaluate us. Would you be willing to write us a positive review on, uh, uh, be able to, will you be willing to copy and paste, you know, copy this review onto uh, Yelp or Google Business or Avvo? Uh, the first place I'd recommend going to is Google, getting a Google Business review. Uh, Google places high value on that, and you and like when someone searches specifically for your firm, the first thing usually the first thing that shows up on the sidebar area is your firm listing, and there may be star rating next to it uh, based on the reviews if you have reviews, and so that's the first place I'd go uh, if they have a, if your client has Yelp and Avvo, those are also great places to go. I'd probably my order preference. For the most part, and it may differ from for some firms, would be Google Business, Yelp, and then Avvo. Um, that's probably where I'd, I'd go. Okay, awesome. And you're recommending Google Business because when people search Google for a lawyer or for your name, they're going to see that those reviews in Google, correct? Yes, and it shows up in Google Maps as well. So uh, cool. if you are trying to get better search visibility, the the more stuff, positive reviews that you have, that also is going to help your Google Map uh, local SEO. And uh, one thing I will add as well, so there's one thing to see a review on your website, you know, by text, people, people could think, oh, maybe they made it up, maybe it's their cousin, whatever, but a video review is super powerful. So if you can get, it's probably going to be hard, but if you can get a client to give you a video review on their iPhone, or maybe they're in front of you, you just want a case for them, they're in your office, pull out your iPhone, ask them if they'll do a review, if they allow it, obviously get their consent, and uh, that will help you tremendously and blast that every put it on your blog on your website on YouTube on your Facebook page video reviews help tremendously as we all know and uh, okay so next up I know some people are waiting for this section so social media talk to that this is a huge topic so talk to us about that yeah I mean we could spend all day on social media yeah. uh, I, I, I really want to uh, highlight a few things that I'd recommend in particular so we talked a little bit before about social media advertising how you can target um, but I want to talk about like kind of organic social media, building your firm social media profiles, uh, building your branding, and then posting content and engaging with other people. So social media can be dangerous 
because it can be a huge time suck for a, not a lot of return. Uh, and your, the actual return can be hard to measure. So the best way that I would kind of think about social media and evaluate social media is from the lens of staying top of mind with referrals. Most of the people that you're friends with and connected with on social media are probably colleagues, are probably family members, are probably friends. It's not necessarily people that are going to need your services, but for your, let's say, for your thousand connections on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn, each of those connections that you have have a thousand more connections and plenty of people that you don't know. And the content that you share and and you being engaged on social media uh, with others is a reminder to other people and your audience that you do practice in this area and that if they need uh, if they need a lawyer to refer uh, in your practice area that you're the first one that they're going to think of. Um, social media can be tough because there needs to be a good amount of involvement in it, uh, which is why I say you know it can be a time suck if you don't if you're not using it in the best way possible. In particular, they say that of any, the likelihood that any particular member of your network sees your post or share or comment is about two percent, which is really low, especially for the effort that you are putting into your content. Um, so in general, I, like from the perspective of I want to stay in the minds of people in my audience, um, kind of one that, that's kind of like the approach that I would take. And so I, I wouldn't be taking it from the approach of I, uh, everyone on, on Facebook can be my potential client, can get a divorce or get a will or sue their employer because you've seen those kind of posts. Uh, I've seen plenty of law firms that post on Twitter or share, uh, share content on Facebook. If you've been in an accident, reach out to us. And you know, for me in particular, I, I think, you know, personally I think that's kind of cheesy and that's not going to be effective on me. But what would be effective would be if a law firm posts on Facebook, here's this client, you know, I really appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, this client testimonial we got here, the testimonial, you know, it was a privilege to work uh, to get this individual the compensation they deserved for uh, their employer uh, wrongfully terminating them and getting them justice. That's powerful. That's going to make me think, oh, wow, this firm does a great job. Oh, hey, I have another uh, a friend that, that is having an issue with their employer. I may want to refer them. That seemed, that's really my recommendation for the best use of uh, social media. And, Tools for that, uh, managing all your different social media channels. Hootsuite is what it's is what uh, my preferred app is, and that's why I recommend for yep. you as well. This way, you don't have to jump between Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, one thing I will add as well: so Hootsuite is great because you can automatically schedule posts for the future on Facebook, Twitter, everywhere you want. But uh, on Facebook, so what, what you mentioned before was that yeah. Facebook only shows your posts now to 2 to 3% of all your fans, which is really annoying. So they changed that to 2% a, a while ago because they want you to spend money and advertise yeah. them, but it actually does help when you have a really good post that you really want to promote or that's doing really well on Facebook. Facebook will recommend and say, hey, this post is hot. It's getting 90% more engagement. You should boost and promote and sponsor the post. So you might be thinking, oh, okay, stop trying to get me to spend money, but you should really listen to that algorithm because that post will do a whole lot better and get seen by a lot more people if you just boost it for $5. That's it, five bucks. <laughs> so whenever you have like a hot post, something you want to promote, I highly, highly recommend going to your Facebook fan page, boosting the post by five or 10 bucks to your fans or your fans and friends of fans. It really makes a huge difference on Facebook. Cool. All right, let's go to the next uh, the next slide. Email marketing. All right, one of my favorites also. So well, let's see what you recommend. So email, I would take kind of in the same vein as social media, in that for the most part, the people on your email lists, uh, if you if you have email lists, are colleagues, are uh, <clears throat> people in your network, not necessarily potential clients, unless your clients are other lawyers. And so I would take you know take the, take a similar approach with email, in that. Uh, email is much more likely to be viewed by your intended audience. Of you know emails that you're sending out, 
97% or 98% on average are going to reach the other person's, the other, reach the recipient's inbox. Um, and uh, depending on how good your open rates are, you can see, you know, 20 to 50% of uh, the people uh, who receive your email to open them. Uh, but at the very least, everyone's going to see the subject line. Everyone's going to uh, that everyone's going to see that that you sent an email uh, related to your practice area. That that they read the subject line. They probably saw the preview line, uh, and it, it you know reminds them about you. And what I recommend is have a newsletter that you know shares any blog content that you have, shares a testimonial or a recent win, some sort of social proof. You know what I mean by that is like a testimonial or a recent award or a verdict or a settlement, something that demonstrates. How your firm's success um, and share your content as well. Uh, that stuff can be really effective to remind people to you know to stay top of mind to help generate more referrals. And because email marketing is so inexpensive compar comparatively to other mediums, I definitely recommend it. One other thing that I that with email that I think is really underutilized by a lot of firms is a drip email campaign. Uh, yes. You would, um, if you have if you have uh, content if you um, if you have a downloadable guide uh, share it uh, by, behind like an email wall like basically say if you want to download our guide put your email here and what you do is after they download after they give you their email you should it, your email software would automatically send them the guide and follow up, and it would follow up with um, some additional information uh, like another email about uh, that's still relevant to the topic. Another email that's you know uh, our firm has experience in this practice area. Another email basically kind of reaching out, saying that you know if you need any help, uh, re you know you can call us or email us and we'll get back to you right away. And that can help cultivate a new potential client. Yep. And uh, did you did you mention which email service you recommend? Do you re you like Mailchimp, Constant Contact, something simple for attorneys? I do like MailChimp. MailChimp is probably the most simple. It's the easiest to use. They have a free tier, so you can try it out. Uh, but if you want to do automations, there you have to join the paid tier. Uh, I, for the majority of law firms, I'd recommend MailChimp. Uh, I think uh, another like a more advanced piece of software like HubSpot or Infusionsoft for most lawyers is overkill. Yep, I definitely agree. All right, so um, I think I'm going to cover the next slide here. I know you haven't seen this one yet. I'm happy you said MailChimp actually, because uh, Practice Panther actually syncs right now as of the last week or two with MailChimp. So for all of nice. our customers, yeah. So for every all of our members listening in, we actually do have a MailChimp sync. You can go to your settings on the bottom left, integrations, and you will see the the MailChimp sync, which is in beta. So the cool thing is that you don't need to maintain this; it does it automatically for you. You can basically sync Practice Panther with MailChimp. In Practice Panther, we have tags. So you can group people into lists, which are called tags for us. And let's say the tag is they're a family law client. So you put them in the family law tag, which will sync with your family law list in MailChimp. And if you set up automation like you just mentioned, it will automatically send them emails based on family law. Cool. So, uh, so let's actually show you how this works. Really simple. In Practice Panther, you just activate the sync. And then in MailChimp, you have to turn on automation. So I believe, like you said, you have to have the, the paid plan, but I think it's $15 a month. And what automation does is any time a new lead comes in, in this list that you define in MailChimp, automatically send them the first email a day later, the second email five days later, the third email a month later. So it always keeps you top of mind. And these emails shouldn't just be promotional. They should be really good tips. So if someone's looking to get a divorce, God forbid, it basically tells them, step one, this is what you need to do. This is my second tip of the week. You know, give them good quality information so they will know, wow, you're very trustworthy. And uh, well, Andrew, let me ask you, what is the ethics about sending drip campaigns? Do you have to get their consent? Or once they contact you, then you could automatically put them in here? Um, good question uh, about the ethics aspect to it. It might so, change by state, so it's always good to just ask them, I think. Yeah, uh, the, broadly the safest thing to do is uh, have a double opt-in, which I believe MailChimp does, so that if someone, if someone uh, fills out a downloadable, 
uh, fills out a form for downloadable, the next thing that should happen is they get an email from MailChimp saying, please confirm your email to opt in. And once they've opt in, opted in, you kind of have that you have this relationship now with this person. It is not a solicitation in the aspect. It's not like not a solicitation in the aspect that this person does not that, that because this person has this uh, relationship uh, with you. And I, I would I would recommend having a private having a if you're doing this kind of thing, I'd recommend having a privacy policy on your website. No, uh, providing a notification that if you uh, if you opt in, to, uh, to, if you subscribe to our mailing list, you may receive uh, some kind of emails that are uh, promotional uh, in nature. Um, and in particular, if you are sending an email that is purely self-promotional, basically the extent of this is an email communication designed to get you to hire my firm. I would, uh, if you're in New York, for example, uh, where I'm based. You have to have a disclaimer that says this is attorney advertising, uh, where if it's any advertisement that you need an attorney advertising disclaimer. I think I believe New York is the only state that has that unique requirement, um, but uh, it's important nonetheless. Well, I never heard of that. Very cool. Um, okay, so marketing management. So, do you want me to go to the next slide with the picture or not yet? Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> All right. So I was I'm very curious to ask you about this. This is a guy with. Uh, with a saw in his hand looking up a big tree? Yeah, so you, you need the right tools with your law firm's marketing management. That's, that's the idea that I was going for with this okay. picture. Um, so part of the, pro, like part of your marketing management, you know, you've gotten these people, you've gotten, you've spent a lot of money and a lot of effort to get people to reach out to your firm. But now what are you going to do to get them to, how are you going to get them to sign up with your firm and how are you going to manage them through that process. And that's something that every firm really needs to audit and evaluate uh, with some regularity. Um, so we've, we've worked with some firms, for example, where they've got, where they've, they've been like, you know, we've been getting a ton of leads, but we haven't been getting as many clients as we were hoping. And so then we take a step back and we're like, well, what's your process like? Um, and so uh, like how how frequently are you answer like are you answering the phone right away? Are you setting up a consultation? Are you then following up with the potential client to get them to sign a retainer? Are you how are you sending out the retainer? How are you what what's your cadence? What's the process? Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about kind of all of the above. So uh, make sure that like, you really have to have good procedures because <clears throat> otherwise you are wasting your potential marketing spend. And so I would take a, a kind of a very wide angle view of what's happening to uh, from every step of the process. Um, uh, so you should know where, you, well one, you should be able to know where, where, your, where your potential clients are coming from. You should be able to ideally get, uh, once they get in touch, you are on answering that phone the first time they call. You're getting their information. Your your whoever is answering the phone is qualifying this potential client or determining that they are not a uh, suitable client for the firm, and then setting up a consult with the lawyer. If there is a if there is a fee that's needed for that consultation, getting that information that you need, uh, that client should, that potential client should be going into your CRM, uh, your software, so that you can manage them through every step of the process. And so that once you've had this initial contact, you know when to follow up next, um, because not every client or signs up who signs up who reaches out to you will sign a retainer agreement after the first conversation. That's probably not the, ma not the majority of clients uh, who, re who reach out to you from an internet contact form or a phone call from an ad or your SEO. Uh, they are very different from a referral. A referral lead to your firm is going to be a lot more forgiving because they want to work with you. They were referred to you, they want, and um, that's, good, that's good for them. They want to now work with your firm and so if you don't call them back, they will probably call you back. But someone who clicked on an ad and called your firm, if you don't call them back, they're going to say like, well I guess this firm is not really on top of on top of its processes, that's kind of makes me hesitant about working with the firm. Maybe I, maybe I, I, I made the wrong choice. 
let me just go into Google and like I did before, uh, find another law firm that is going to be more responsive. Got it. Yeah, I definitely, rec I definitely agree. It's all about the processes and procedures, which, uh, which is the next slide. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the, kind of the first thing I, I want to talk about is um, uh, what, how do you know where, where your clients and potential clients are coming from? This screenshot is a piece of software called CallRail which I very strongly recommend, um, which is a piece of software that basically you use to track all of the incoming, you can track, use to track the incoming phone calls to your firm uh, based on different sources. So basically, I put a piece of code on my website, the call out code, and then when someone visits my website, they'll see a phone number. It won't be my, you know, my firm's main phone number, but it'll be one of several phone numbers that is tied to that visitor. So I so this way, when they call, I know that I got a call from someone clicking a paid ad. I know that I got, got this person who called coming from uh, organic Google search. This way, when, when my firm, uh, person doing the intake says, how did you find out about us? And they say, oh, I found you on Google. That doesn't really, you know, which doesn't really help you. You know that they found you through an organic search or a paid ad, and if it's a paid ad, what keyword they clicked, so you know how to attribute uh, your different uh, your leads by sources. And now a lot of firms have been using this for a long t using these kind of services for a long time, even before like CallRail existed. Uh, a lot of firms had different phone numbers for different mediums. So, like in the 90s, for example, you could have a firm that has uh, you would ha you could have a, a phone number for a specific TV spot, so they can kind of evaluate. We got 20 calls. From uh, to this phone number this month uh, related to this one TV spot. So this way we know what the ROI is of that particular channel or campaign. And so now we can know, uh, now that we have this technology, we can know uh, very specifically what calls are coming in from which sources. So I would strongly recommend, uh, you know, a, as part of your efforts to, figure, to optimize your processes, get a piece of call tracking uh, software. Cool. Love it. And uh, all right, so now you're going to talk about pretty much like CRM software, I'm guessing? Yes. Yeah, so when someone reaches out, uh, you have to track them through the entire stage of this, for better or worse, uh, I, I know I, people hate the term sale because, you know, a lot of lawyers think, you know, I, it's not really sales. I don't like couching it like that. But, uh, the, I mean, but a law firm is a business, and when people speak with speak with a lawyer or speak with a paralegal, um, they have to decide whether they're going to retain the firm and they're going to sign a retainer agreement. And a lot of sales CRM software is perfect for lawyers that want to track track their different channels, track all of their potential clients and potential deals, I guess as you could call them, uh, from beginning to end. And tracking them is important because. Uh, I've I've seen where it can be an issue where if you if you get a call today and you say you'll call you say you'll call them back or you, your paralegal gave you a note and you have to call them back or you did call them and you're waiting for them to get back to you you may forget or some things may slip through the cracks and you may not follow up with them as uh, you should or get get to that yes definitive yes I'm ready to retain you here's the, my signed retainer or no I'm not ready to hire you um, or or uh, you know, uh, you know, I, and I don't want to start my business yet. Uh, I'm looking for information now, but get back to me in six months. A CRM helps you manage all of that, and a spreadsheet or a notepad or something like that just is not going to be anywhere near as effective. Right, definitely agree. And um, you know, we actually have uh, this awesome feature in, in Practice Panther that I'm sure most of the people listening are using, hopefully. But uh, like you said, they have to find out where their leads are coming from. So this is a very easy thing that we built into the software where anytime you're adding a new contact in, so someone calls you, hey, I want a quote, how much do you charge, whatever it is, you add them into the software, and then you add them to a list, and you ask them, where did you hear about us from? Oh, I found you in Avo. Okay, so you add them to a list called Avo. Oh, I saw, uh, I saw you on Google. Put it on Google, wherever, on Facebook, add Facebook. So the whole goal is, once you track all this, at the end of every week or every month, you could see how many people came from every marketing source and how much money 
they've spent with you. So how much billable time do you have? How many invoices have you sent out? How much money have you gotten paid from them? So at the end of the month, you can say, all right, I spend $500 on Facebook or $250 on Avvo this month, but I actually made $800 according to yeah. my CRM software or Practice Panther. So it's very important that you keep track of your spending because you should never just spend money without tracking how much you made in return. Awesome. All right. And uh, oh, one more here. Okay, so I guess we'll add this one as well. So uh, intake forms. So like you mentioned, you can automate all the client intake for free, unlimited. If you're using our software, it comes it comes with it. So on your website, you could put a contact form with first name, last name, phone number, email address, description. What's your question? And it will automatically send all that information into your software, into Practice Panther. So you don't need to manually add the entry again. Or if a client comes into your office for the first time and you want to hand them like a long intake form on paper, they have to fill it out on paper, your paralegal has to type it in, hopefully not make any mistakes. With this, you give them an iPad or a computer and say, hey, fill out this form. As soon as they fill it out, it automatically goes into Practice Panther, creates a contact for them, creates a matter if you want, and then in one click, you could generate a document like a retainer agreement and say, hey, here you go, sign this within five seconds. They will be super impressed of how high tech you are. So these tools exist, and there are a lot of them out there. Use them. You know they're here for you to help you automate your firm so you can get more done in less time. So definitely, definitely use them. Um, all right, and uh, Andy, I'll let you take this one over for your fo follow up. Nice. Um, so using your CRM, um, make sure that that you have a regular follow up rhythm with the potential clients that you've spoken with or your paralegal has spoken with. And um, you know, in different, some different pieces of software, you can set up kind of like a next activity date or a calendar appointment to follow up next, and then after that, a next follow up. But there should be a regular rhythm that you have down, so that if you've spoken with a client who is reviewing your retainer, uh, get in touch with them every other day, or uh, or at, at the very least, I'd say twice a week until the point where they've said, you know what, I'm I'm not ready yet call me in a week as you know or they give you a date to follow up next until the point where they've set or until the point when they've said um, I'm ready to, I'm ready to sign up now or you know what I'm just not going with your with your firm uh, it it is this is like an uh, something to take from from uh, sales basically uh, the most effective like the firms that we've worked with that have been the best at retaining new clients are the ones that are consistent with the follow-up. And I've been a consumer of legal services myself in the past, and uh, I, I've always been most impressed by the firms that are on top of their game, the ones that are reaching out to me to see if I have any questions or uh, uh, following up on our last conversation to see, you know, what, what are the next steps, because inertia is powerful uh, for a lot of people. And it's, you know, and hiring a lawyer is a big undertaking. It's, it can be a big expense. And so having a, making sure that your firm is consistent in following up will make sure that you retain more clients than you would otherwise. Because often you just need to uh, send a reminder, uh, either a call or an email, I kind of alternate with both, to get in touch to see what the next steps are. And sometimes, you know, things, other things happen and this becomes, hiring the lawyer becomes less important and things fall through the crack. And so uh, getting in touch uh, reminds them, oh yeah, I, I was going to hire a lawyer, I was going to have get help uh, starting my entity, uh, my legal entity for my business, let's do that now. And so you're helping them out to, to get on track and uh, go through this next phase. So follow up is very important and having software that can help you out with that is also a bonus. Yep, I agree. So uh, this one's cool. So electronic signatures, I definitely love this. Yes. Uh, uh, so one way to make the sign-on process more effortless uh, is with electronic retainer agreements. Uh, I personally use and love DocuSign. I strongly recommend it. Uh, although Hello Signature and Write Signature and Adobe EchoSign are great too. Uh, if someone needs to print out and then sign and then send back something, it can be a it can be a bit of friction, create a bit of friction, and it can make someone like either it can either delay the process or make them less likely to sign. But if you can e-sign 
uh, then uh, it makes everything a lot easier. And if you have you know, template retainer agreements that you use over and over again, you can whip one up in really just a few minutes where all you need to do is throw in uh, your template. Or, and if you have like DocuSign, for example, you just use your template, add in the client name and email address, and then you're good to go. Yeah, and I'll add in some input on this as well. So back in a previous company I used to run, we were sending out contracts, and the clients had to print it, sign it, fax it, scan it, take a picture of it. Like, it was just a nightmare. So a typical contract would come back in about two weeks. We had to follow up all the time manually. It was just very annoying. Once we switched, we use actually Adobe EchoSign. Once we switched to EchoSign, I'm not even kidding. We were getting contracts back in an hour, sometimes even minutes. It. it was crazy. And it made them make up their mind and say, because I signed the contract, I'm going with them. I'm hiring them. And if they didn't sign it, we didn't have to do the follow-up. EchoSign, DocuSign, they automate it for you. They keep emailing your clients, reminding them, you haven't signed the contract, you haven't signed the contract. So it automatically follows up for you as well. And for the cost of like $15 a month, it is, it's amazing. You should definitely use it. Um, all right, so I think that wraps it up. Wow, awesome, awesome. So Andy, thank you. Thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, we're going to... We're going to open it up for questions right now. So uh, if everyone wants, they can flip back over to their screen. And uh, Andy was, uh, was very generous enough to give you all this contact information, email, phone number, website. You could schedule a call with him if you have any questions for him, you want to retain him or anything like that. So uh, Andy, thank you so much. Once again, a lot of people don't know what you do full time. So kind of let everyone know what you do and how you kind of help attorneys worldwide. Yeah, of course. So uh, I am the managing director of Juris Page, which uh, is an internet marketing agency that helps law firms build out their web presence, whether it's building a website or building an online marketing campaign, whether it's a paid or search campaign, um, helping, them, helping law firms get better visibility. Now, not every firm wants to get more clients from the internet to create an ad campaign or a, or a search optimization campaign. A lot of firms just need their, basically, their online business card. They want uh, a good web presence so that after someone's been referred to the firm, when, when that person inevitably goes to the internet to check up and see that this law firm does in fact practice in this practice area and has experience and can handle my case, uh, they want to see a good looking website and we help out with that as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So uh, for everyone listening, please start sending in your questions for Andy in the GoToWebinar chat box you should see an area where you could type in questions and we will answer all of them. And uh, this webinar was recorded, so we will email it to you after the webinar if you ever want to review anything. So let's go with uh, a question from Natalie. She's asking a question regarding call rail. How would this work if you have the same vanity number that you use across all platforms? Also, how would this affect what you mentioned earlier about using the same number across all platforms? So, um, Natalie, I think what you should probably be doing is adding one number for Facebook, one for Instagram, one for Twitter, one for your website. That's at least my idea. But Andy, what do you think? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question, and uh, I get that a, a lot, and I, I should have addressed this earlier. So uh, basically, uh, what you so for your directory profiles, for like the SEO directory profiles, for like Google Business and Yelp and Avo, you should have the regular number for the firm, the one that, that, that is going to appear in most places. And on your website also, you should have that main number. So if you have your vanity number, uh, that should, it should appear there as well. Um, software like CallRail, uh, what it technically does is it, it's, a, it's a few lines of code, a script basically, that uh, it doesn't affect the, like it, the website itself, as Google reads it, will be that vanity number. But when someone visits the website, uh, the number basically switches out, swaps out to a different number for that uh, visitor in particular. Uh, so it for it, so it doesn't hurt you for SEO um, if you have a uh, call rail on top of your website and your website itself has you know its vanity number uh, showing up. But for things like uh, advertising, like Google, like Google AdWords or a video ad, I would probably like for if you're doing if you're doing a video campaign or you're doing videos, I would probably have a separate phone number for uh, for some videos. This way, you know when you got a call from that video, 
um, uh, I, I've done video campaigns myself, and it was really helpful having a phone number specifically for the videos, so I knew that the person who called called because they were they were watching one of my videos, so I could kind of see what the return on investment was for that video to know that it was worth uh, keep, worth uh, doing again because I was getting increase from that. Uh, as for like Google Ads and Google Advertising, if you're sending people ultimately to a landing page on your website that has CallRail installed, uh, it's kind of the same as uh, any any other web page with CallRail. It it doesn't affect the underlying website as it'll appear in, as, as Google reads it, and it won't negatively affect your SEO. But uh, there will be a specific phone number that's given to that visitor, uh, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, it definitely does. So um, someone actually had a similar question, so I guess we'll ask it now regarding Google AdWords. So um, how does it work with Google AdWords? So you have a lot of different ads and ad groups. Do you just put in like a special code or script, or you have to generate new numbers for every single ad or ad group that you want to add a number? Oh, so there, are, I guess there are a few different things. Um, you, usually, most commonly, ads uh, like ads and ads and AdWords don't have a phone number necessarily at, uh, on the ad, where it's usually a uh, website address, a uh, headline, and then a description, where it's. Uh, local DUI lawyer. We're available to available to talk now, 24/7. Uh, five star rated uh, in Google or something like that. And when you click the ad, it goes to a landing page. And if the web landing page has CallRail installed, uh, that particular each visitor basically gets their own phone number assigned to them. Uh, this way, you can effective what it, what it ends up doing is it makes it so that you can track uh, each keyword click. So if you have CallRail tied in with your analytics or Google AdWords software, you can see that auto accident lawyer uh, got, a, got a call or, or that uh, medical malpractice lawyer got a call. And that's how that works. But uh, another alternative, which I, I think uh, the question might be alluding to is, what about the phone numbers that appear on AdWords themselves, like for like a call only ad? Um, and those you can use different phone numbers, and uh, we do. So, like, I have multiple phone numbers for call-specific ads. Um, this way, I can kind of A/B test them, so I can see this ad copy performs better than that ad copy. Um, and the phone numbers are relatively inexpensive. Um, a local number with a service like CallRail, I think, can be like. Uh, one dollar fifty to two dollars fifty cents a month, um, and you can always repurpose them. So, is if you if you decide that you know I, I'm done with this A/B test, I want to run another A/B test, uh, you can do that as well and use them for those campaigns. Okay, so they don't charge you by the minutes; they just charge you by the for the number. That's it. Oh, they they do also charge you for by, by the minute, but uh, they have kind of like a they have different packages, and for the most part. Uh, for the most part, you probably won't go over their allotment. Uh, but from what I remember, they have plans that kind of—I think they, they start around thirty dollars a month. That include like a keyword pool of like six to eight keywords. Uh, I don't remember what they end up charging. Like we, we do have our own agency plan where we have different firm, well, a lot of different firms on, and so we get a preferential rate from them. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. And uh, someone just said that they were they missed the first half. So how could they watch it after? So for everyone listening, right now it's actually on Facebook Live. So when we finish, Facebook will have the video ready to go. You can watch it right away. And we're also going to be sending an email afterwards with the recorded webinar as well. So the next question comes from Rebecca. Do you recommend Twitter to find new clients or for branding? So I know Andy, we were just talking about it before the call. You're big on Twitter. So what do you think? Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I. I don't feel like I've mastered Twitter by any means. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so, for, for and there are a. I, for what I've seen, there are a handful of firms and like a handful of firms that seem to get Twitter and have done uh, have worked out Twitter well for lead generation purposes, reaching out end users. That doesn't. In, in experience, and from what I've seen, that isn't the case for a majority of firms. Uh, the firms that, other firms that tend to be more successful and find success with Twitter is engaging with their community. Um, 
uh, if you're following other lawyers, other colleagues, other friends, uh, and they're following you back, and there are discussions going on on Twitter, and you can contribute to them with your knowledge related to your practice, um, that helps you stay top of mind, and that's good branding for your firm. Um, one uh, good example that uh, I like, there's a, a well-known lawyer here in uh, New York who has a very specific niche related to, uh, 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 it's called like revenge porn law, where if you're the victim, <laughs> yeah, if, if, wow. you're the victim, if you're a victim, if someone, if a, an ex has posted uh, photos of you online and you want to get an injunction to get those, uh, those uh, photos uh, taken down or you want to uh, get, like, uh, file a lawsuit for cyber stalking, this lawyer in particular, she's very uh, active on social media and she's have found a very specific niche and um, her, her name is Carrie Carrie Goldberg, and she uh, does it very well. She's very active. She engages with other lawyers. She, um, uh, you know, like she's posting occasionally, like articles that, that are come out related to the firm, and it's it's definitely great for the firm's branding. And I think having that niche uh, is also very helpful. Okay. Awesome. 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 Let's see the next question comes from, well, similar question actually, from Craig, who says, there are so many different social media channels out there, I have no idea which one I should be focusing on. Do you recommend spending time on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Snapchat? Um, the, way, the way I think of it is, where are the people that you want to get in touch with and Correct. you want to have conversations with. And so for a majority of lawyers, I don't think Snapchat is probably the right place to go. Uh, who's going to, who on Snapchat is going to follow your law firm for, for the most part? Um, uh, unless you're someone like the Texas Law Hawk, for example. And <laughs> don't know who, you got to say it with a crazy it, voice, the crazy voice. Texas Lawhawk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good. That was really good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so unless you're someone who has a very unique branding, um, or, or you're funny, or uh, you kind of have a kind of brand like that, and if you don't know the Texas Lawhawk, uh, search YouTube for the Texas Lawhawk. He was actually yes. part of a top. He was part of a Taco Bell Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> wow. Um, Snapchat is probably not the way to go. Um, uh, Facebook is my, probably my biggest recommendation, just because that's where that's a pretty uh, personal area where that's where a lot of people hang out. They, you know, you're sharing content, and people are active and they're engaged there. Uh, LinkedIn is very much a kind of business uh, professional space, and so if you're looking to connect with other lawyers, for example. LinkedIn can probably be great. Um, uh, that's probably the, uh, an area that I recommend. Um, Twitter is probably one that I wouldn't necessarily recommend so much um, uh, for engagement. The Twitter is good for some things, though. So if you're at like a legal conference, for example, or if you're at conferences in general, a lot of conferences will say, you know, keep the conversation going with the hashtag whatever, hashtag whatever conference this is. And that can be a good way to be engaged with other people who are at this conference or event and to be part of that discussion. Right, correct. Okay, last question. So this is the last question. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to uh, email Andrew directly at andrew at jurispage.com or just ask us right now. So last question comes from Jane. How, this is a good question, actually. How do you place value or ROI on social media as it's hard to track? So, you know, I had this problem actually with a, with a previous company where we were just doing so much social media efforts and they were just like, well, this is just branding. Like, how do you, you know, you're spending five hours a week on this. What's the return? So is there a way that you can track the return on all this stuff? Uh, social, so you, with social, you're not going to get that kind of numbers that you're going to get from with pay-per-click advertising, like you're you're not gonna like you're not gonna know necessarily that this one tweet or this particular uh, post generated whatever 
what what generated that particular client. Um, and it's it's just not it it's just not as easy to track. But it's, if it's if it's part of your firm's over like if it's part of your firm's overall branding and strategy, and if you have the time to do it and do it right, it's something that I I would recommend. Um, there's one uh, 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 social media guy. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary V. Uh, Gary V. Yeah. Uh, he he's famous for he was at this conference and he was speaking and he's talking about this exact thing that someone. He was at a pitch, and then the client said, "Well, what kept selling? Telling him, well, what's the ROI? And what's the ROI of social media? And what's the ROI of social?" And then he blurts out, "Well, what's the ROI of of your mom?" <laughs> <laughs> what and, the and, heck? and then he and then he backtracks, and he's like, "Well, I love my mother very much, but I'm not going to put a dollar value on my mother. Uh, social media is your firm is your firm's brand, and your firm engaging with others online, and." That's that's really the best way to think of your firm, and I definitely butchered his explanation of that whole thing. Uh, <laughs> and I'm it's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna actually pull up his book for people that are interested. This is a great book I actually read myself called Jab 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 Right Hook from Gary V, and uh, it gives you like a lot of case studies what the big companies are doing. So the whole idea behind this book is basically your. In social media, you're, you're jabbing. You're throwing like good content, good content, good content, and then upper hook them on the fifth or tenth post with a promotion. You know, see, so a lot of people are doing social media wrong because they're, they're just like, oh, I'm the best lawyer. Look how good I am. We won this case. We did this. We like, no one really cares. So you'll notice that like when you throw out good content, those will generally get more likes, more shares, more comments. But when you're just selfless, shameless promotion, it doesn't usually do that well. So that's what the book is about. It gives you really good examples, and it's definitely recommended. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, I have a question for you, Andy. Any good books that you recommend for people to get more into online marketing, SEO, social media, anything that you read that's like, that was the best book I ever read that you could recommend? Oh, um, Devil in the White City by Eric Larson is a great book about the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Um, okay. That is. <laughs> <laughs> I like this is in social media. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, unrelated, but I do like that book very much. Um, okay. For for in terms of like content, in terms of reading for SEO and uh, PPC, uh, I personally I put out a lot. Their uh, Juris page has an SEO ebook and a PPC. Uh, I think it's a course. It, it used to be an ebook. I mean, turned it into a course to try that out. I think that's right. Um, um, we have a ton of content. Other websites that I'd recommend, um, uh, Moz, it's M-O-Z dot com. Yep. They, have, they have a great blog. Another website that has a great blog related to marketing is called HubSpot. Uh, the thing about that is they will aggressively try and sell you their marketing automation software, so just be mindful of that. Um, uh, but their content is great. Uh, those two are probably my 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 go-tos. Oh, also another one, uh, a website called WordStream uh, yep. writes writes a lot of great content for uh, pay-per-click advertising. Uh, we we actually we use their software uh, for uh, for our pay-per-click management and uh, pay-per-click with uh, some of our clients uh, and uh, their content and their stuff is really great. Yep, okay. and I'm going to actually, while you were talking, I was looking up some books that I've actually read before in marketing, so I'm going to pull up some on my screen right now. So for everyone listening in, if you want flip to the screen, this is going to be the last thing that we're going to show you today. So this is a good book. Seth Godin is always a great marketer everyone's heard of. So Purple Cow, it's pretty much like you need to be the Purple Cow. You need to stand out. What makes you different than every other law firm out there? Uh, this was a really good book, 80-20, sales and marketing. It pretty much is like the 80-20 Pareto principle rule that 80% um, of your business comes from 20% of your customers, 80% of your headaches come from 20% of your customers, so okay. focus on the ones that make you the most money and get rid of the ones that are just a hassle and a headache. This one, like we said before, Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords, great book if you want to learn Google AdWords, and it's really easy. Uh, this is actually an interesting book, you know, in this one I had a lot of notes, a lot of actions that I took away from this book, so it says 77 action ideas, like this was just full of good quality content that you could put to use right away. I hate books with a lot of fluff and just 
generalization, this is a great book. So these are my top four, I'd say. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So uh, that's it for now. If anyone has any more questions, you can email myself or Andy at any time. And um, once again, Andy, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. The webinar was recorded, so we will email to you everyone shortly. And Andy, once again, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, David. It was a lot of fun. It was awesome. All right, everyone, have a great weekend. Take care.